Hello, well-read family and into the biscuit family. I'm going to put this at the beginning of both podcasts this week. Uh, There's been some talk online about what to do with your content this week. There was a trend called Blackout Tuesday that I always understood to mean don't post your little dick jokes. Don't post your songs about taking your girl down to the river that you should be entirely focused on this moment in history and the issues surrounding it specifically, racism, Black Lives Matter, and police brutality. But a lot of people took it to mean, apparently, that out of respect for those issues, we should be completely silent. Uh, We have as you know by listening to this episode right now, chosen not to do that. And I think everyone should choose not to do that. Blackout Tuesday was never meant to be everybody be quiet. It was meant to be everybody amplify black voices. Fill the space with black voices. Don't leave the space. So what follows is our experiences, protesting, and a conversation about what needs to happen. And we're not doing that to put ourselves in place of black people and black voices. We're doing that because this is a white space for the most part. If you're listening right now, just percentage-wise, you're white. And we're trying to both help you and give you information and thoughts and perhaps conversation starters with your own family. And we are trying to convict you to do those things. That being said... There is an essay written by my friend Jerry Brown. It is on my Twitter, my Instagram, and my Facebook page uh, that I would challenge you all to read. And it's an open letter to white women who keep asking what they can do to combat racism. I believe she addresses it to white women because she, as a woman, is often asked by white women. So white women, don't, don't clutch your pearls. I think she's writing to you because your group is the only one who's reached out to her, white men. Um, At the end of it, she provides a list of names and organizations that you can look to to educate yourself. I'm going to read some of those now. Tourmaline, T-O-U-R-M-A-L-I-N-E. By the way, as I do this, I guess I could read their handles, but I don't even know what platform that handle's on. Just use your Google. Janet Mock, a storyteller. The Audrey Lorde Project. India Moore, India with a Y. Laverne Cox. Angelica Ross. Stephanie E. Jones-Rogers, Stella Megney, M-E-G-N-I-E, Trayvon Free, I follow Trayvon on Twitter, he is brilliant, Neil Drumming, Sarah Clark, Shawnee Ashley, Hope Giselle, Breen Brown, B-R-N-E Brown, Lauren Froderman, Comfort Fedoki, F-E-D-O-K-E. These are artists, activists, people of color who are discussing race from their perspectives and living, I'm quoting the essay here, beautiful black and brown lives and have helped me, me being Jerry, grow into a better person. Now that's not the whole list. Go to the essay, you can read the whole list. I just know that if I read the whole list, you guys would all fade out on me. The point is that it exists It's there for you. As usual, a black woman has done the work. All you got to do is click on it and learn and be open. And we all got to do that. I would also highly recommend that you guys read White Fragility. It is a book by a white woman that has really affected me. My black cousin recommended it as usual another black woman doing the work and it really walks you through psychologically the types of inherent 
prejudices your society gave you and how you can combat them. If you're of the more academic persuasion, I also recommend you read The New Jim Crow, which will lay out for you how police have, since slavery and up until now, been used to control and imprison black bodies. And that's, that's really, guys, that really is the least you can do. Love you all. So we're all, we're here, here we are, here we are. Uh, I want. Is there will people will any people actually see this? I, I know that's a lot. I'll, I'll put I'll, I'll put this future. one up. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm, so I'm very I, I'm very and for everybody out there that was watching on YouTube, uh, I've been putting them up a little late because it's just it's better to not put the YouTube up at the same time our audio goes out. So I've been told by the podcast geniuses. Uh, but once I started doing that, I got out of the habit of it, and I'm like. 15 episodes behind on getting them up but i will put this one up okay so just a short disclaimer of what we was talking about before we actually started recording if you ever do watch this and see my face uh I, the ridiculousness with which i outwardly am presenting myself does not reflect uh how i'm feeling internally about the current state of our country sure. and situation just so everybody knows i've got a yeah. pink headband in because i just washed my hair and otherwise my hair will be all over the place and all i I don't have any man headbands. All I got is Katie's and barbershops closed. So my facial hair is wild as hell right now, but none of that is intentional. I just don't care anymore. I wanted to uh, start with a, um, you don't look ridiculous really at all. I was just like, you, it's just so funny for me to hear you say that to Corey. Yeah. Well, I think that like, if you, if you hadn't have said anything, then people like our liberal fans not from the south would have been like wouldn't have even thought about what you're looking like and all our friends from back south would be like yeah trey wears pink headbands now he's been out there three years <laughs> right. fucking sense, whatever. you don't look that pink either for the yeah room. really well i it's mean it's quite well oh, that's good to know it's quite pink though but anyway well you know just overthinking things as i want to do uh i was thinking about what i'd always heard was a uh Chinese expression earlier today and I looked it up and I wanted to read this to y'all I'm sure you've everybody's heard it I think this is from Wikipedia the expression <clears throat> may you live in interesting times is an English expression which purports to be a translation of a traditional Chinese curse while seemingly a blessing the expression is normally used ironically life is better in uninteresting times of peace and tranquility than in interesting times which are typically times of trouble. Despite being so common in English as to be known as the Chinese curse, the saying is apocryphal and no actual Chinese source has ever been produced. There is no known equivalent expression in Chinese. It is most likely connected to uh, analysis from late 19th century speeches from Joseph Chamberlain who attributed to the Chinese. But anyway, that uh, expression has been on my mind a lot lately for obvious reasons. And then I looked it up and it's like, there's not a single, it's almost like there's never a single thing uh, from, you know, Anglo or American history, popular history that doesn't have like a raven background. Yeah, right. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, sure. like, like that's an ancient Chinese curse. That's where everybody always says, and it's just not at all. Like it ain't got nothing to do with them, but uh, it's certainly uh, relevant to where we're at right now, regardless of where it comes from. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, I would, I could really go for a dose of boring for sure. Yeah, though you, what ah, shit? What was it? I just don't hit because I can't remember. You brought it up, Corey. I think on here a recent episode, something about like, I think it had to do with Biden versus Bernie stuff, and they were talking about how many Democrats are just uh, complacent with like, with like boring or not not having to worry about, or you know the president stepping out of line or oh, something yeah. like that. Do you remember what yeah. I'm talking about? Yeah. We were talking about how, I think it was like a whole group conversation. Where we were talking about how awesome it would be if, if we didn't hear from the president. Right. So on the, on the note of not having to hear from or worry about the president and what they're up to is another thing I wanted to do. That's a little more lighthearted, but still I think very relevant to the times at hand before we get into the real like darkness of it all. 
but this is how dark and shitty things are right now. I nearly had like, I don't know if you call it an existential crisis, but certainly a mental crisis the other night, uh, caused directly by the movie Independence Day. The, the 1996 Ooh. summer tentpole blockbuster, blockbuster Will Smith. Like, yeah, but yeah. Not Dumb. only blockbuster, but like when you think of like, kind of like when you hear the word professional wrestler, you immediately think of Hulk Hogan. When I hear blockbuster, literally yeah. the first movie that comes to my mind is Independence Day. Right. So I rewatched Independence Day with my boys the other night. I've been, I've started showing them some. Did it like, hit for them? Yes, it did hit for them very hard. I've started showing them like some more, PG 13 ish type of yeah. stuff that hit for me. They're only seven and eight, but that's how my dad was with me. Cause my dad was more hardcore. I'm pretty sure I watched die hard with my dad when I was like six or seven. Uh, yeah, so, right. so it's like a slightly. Die Hard's really not that bad though. Like if you go back and rewatch right. it, like die hard now is cause it was R then, but like it's easy PG 13 yeah. now. So I've been doing some of that war, like war of the worlds, gremlins, tremors. I loved all those. And the other night we watched independence day. And it holds up. Movie rules. It's it's stupid. Of course it is. It's a big summer blockbuster. But as far as they go, it's like top top shelf. It, yeah. it hold it holds up. It really kicks ass. But <laughs> we're sitting there watching it, and we get to sort of the big emotional climax of the movie, which is when Bill Pullman's character, who is the president of the United States, stands before the the crowd at, on the precipice of the great final battle of mankind against you know the alien invaders and he gives that le legendary yeah. speech you know yeah that ends with uh you, you know july 4th would no longer be an american holiday from this day forward but the day we remember that this is when we uh that's by far the best part of that movie is they were like yeah. by the way this is going to happen on july 4th Right, yeah. He's like, when we stood up and said, we will not go quietly into the night, we will not stand without a fight, you know, yada, yada, today is our Independence Day. Everybody remembers that, and it's very effective. And so I'm sitting there watching it, and at first, the first thing that popped into my head was like, man, fucking imagine Donald oh. Trump having to make a speech like this. And at yeah. first... At first, I started laughing about, you know, in, 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 internally, mentally, like it cracked me up. I was like, that would be a funny scene. It would be to see a Trump impersonator doing like his best version of what this is and how funny that would be. But then, but then I, my train of thought continued on and I've gradually started to get very upset based on this because I was like, the next part I thought I was like, God damn, man, the thought of Donald Trump being the one in charge at some like, pivotal turning point in oh shit oh my god oh shit yeah 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 <laughs> yeah it's like, yeah. It's like yeah. that's literally what's happening right now and and then i started thinking about how because right after he gives that speech he then climbs into a fighter jet <laughs> and leads the leads the you know the last charge of all mankind or whatnot and i just started thinking about how like yes it was ridiculous even in 1996 i'm not saying it wasn't but still, just the idea of like that was sort of the, that's what a that's what the president of the United States is was to in pop yeah, culture, right. like yeah, fictionalized in pop culture. When yeah. you're thinking like we need the prototype of a a great American president for this role in this movie, and that's what they come up with: a war hero, fighter pilot, family man who's empathetic and a great order and inspires people, and then leads by doing and all this shit, and just imagine if the equivalent type of blockbuster was coming out now and they got to like the they probably wouldn't even have the, pre the Dude, president somebody, would get killed off in the first somebody, five minutes because yeah. it would be laughable somebody to even tweeted, try to do that anymore like, somebody tweeted the other day that trump has forever ruined like presidential hostage yeah. movies because like right. now if somebody now if you're watching a movie and they took the president by hostage everybody in the crowd will be like get his ass fucking yeah, cut right. his throat we don't I know i know that's <laughs> what i'm saying that's why i was thinking it's like it's not you couldn't no, it would be laughable to try to have yeah. an inspiring like presidential character like that in a new movie now. And it probably will be that way for some time. That's how much he's damaged the reputation of the office and of this country at large. And obviously with everything like now, he ain't doing no better. It's only worse fucking when the looting starts, the shooting starts. He names Antifa a terrorist organization right in the middle of all this. Like imagine telling, uh, you know, a 98 year old, Papaw that fought the Nazis or whatnot, that being anti-fascist 
makes you a terrorist in this country now. And it's like, I don't know. It's things are so bad, but I keep, I keep thinking about it and then feeling even worse <laughs> because of the fact that who is in charge at this moment. And of course it's not a coincidence either that he's no, in charge of, when all this no, shit is going on. Not. But like, and God, man, I just don't know. I don't know. Well, I don't, I guess gonna work my, out. <laughs> the thing I've been, no, I don't either. And the thing I've been, well, I was struggling with. Yeah. I've been struggling with it today is like just the fucking, the deafening silence on all Trump supporters with his, his complicity towards this, because like, dude, you know, to hear these people tell it, you know, the way they've been telling it through my whole lifetime, at least is like, if something happens during a president's presidency, it was their goddamn fault. Like let anytime some bullshit happened under Obama, it will, it's, it's Obama's fault. Cause he's the president, except for this shit, <laughs> like this shit right. there, there's no way that it could be the commander in chief's fault that the, that the country is literally on fire right after botching a pandemic. None of this, there's no way that this is the leader's fault. This is somehow it, like the, the, the party that tries so hard to preach, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and claim responsibility for your mistakes is the one that is completely going, uh-uh, not me, uh-uh, not me, and making fucking insane batshit excuses as to why they shouldn't be held complicit over stuff that it's like, look, man, if it's not you, then what is your fucking job? Do you even do anything? Yeah. Right. If it happened, it happened during Obama's presidency. It was Obama's fault. If it happens during Trump's presidency, it's Obama's fault. Like, yeah. You know, it's, but I mean, you know, they've been that that way as far as deflecting and all of that. But yeah, it's very, very uh, frustrating. Ain't and for the, for the record, I'm not one of the type of people that blames the president. I try not to blame the president for literally everything that happens because that's insane. Like they can't stop everything and they can't start everything. It's just they absolutely do. And this right here, though, you can see like it just is his goddamn fault. Maybe not the, the actual act of George Floyd being murdered. I'm not necessarily going to put that on Donald Trump because Donald Trump wasn't president during the Rodney King shit and Donald Trump wasn't president. Right, some yeah. of that, so a lot of that, sh some of that shit happened under Obama too. I'm not going to blame him on that, but I am going to absolutely blame him for going on Twitter and being a fucking child and for not showing leadership at all, and for inciting riots, and for loving that this is happening. I'll blame him for how he's reacted to something that I don't think was his fucking fault. Right. I, um, I, like, I've always been, anybody that's on me for long enough knows that I've always, I feel like, been a pretty level-headed person about, like, uh, political climate or crises at large or whatnot, as far as, like, thinking, very, not just thinking outwardly, but truly believing, like, you know, it's okay. Like this too shall pass and maybe we'll come out the other side of it better off, yada, yada, whatever. Like these things happen and sometimes they need to happen, but it'll, you know, it will pass and we'll pull through it and, and that type of thing. And I've always genuinely felt this way. And I think that like right now in this moment is I think the first time in my life as a like politically, culturally conscious person that I, you know, I'm like, I mean, I'm afraid. Like, I, I don't yeah. know. Like, I'm scared right now, and I don't know what the hell is going to happen. The other thing is I've been thinking this whole time, ever since ever since November 2016, I've been thinking mostly because, like, we ain't going to get him out. We're not going to kick him out. I know that. What we have to do is survive until November 2020, and then if we can get him out, it will, you know, we can get past it. That's all we got to do is make it these four years and January 1st, 2020, I was feeling pretty good about that. It's like, we got, sure. we got three years down. We're in the home stretch now, but right now, man, like November, 2020 is like literally closer than it's ever been in this process, but yeah. also has never felt farther away to and, me. I don't think. <laughs> and I, I know, and I hear you. And my thing too, is like, I look at all of this stuff that's going on and in my head, I can make, compelling arguments for this hurting him in the election and i can make compelling arguments for this really helping him in the election like there's part of me that's like all right all those fucking people on the fence if they're if it's possible to still be on the fence in 2020 like i get being on the fence and sick well i don't get it but like it, it was a thing that happened so i'm just going to get past that being on the fence in 2016 17 maybe even 18 but at this point I don't think you're still on the fence, but if there are some people that are still on the fence, surely to God, this made him go, God damn, 
he's not a leader. Like, he's not a leader at all. He's not leading us through the situation. Mm-hmm. And then there's going to be some people who were totally in on him that were just – can't bring myself to do this shit. But, like, at the same time, it's double down time again, and they're the biggest group of double down motherfuckers ever. And like, they're still totally buying into the whole, like, this is realistically both sides are bad and Antifa's doing more, ba- more harm than our side. Hell, they only killed one person. Look at all these riots and businesses, businesses, blah, blah, blah. We got to open the economy. So like, I don't know, man, <laughs> there's part of me that thinks he's going to win in another goddamn landslide. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I just Thanks. don't even – I have what I feel about it, but I don't even like to talk about it openly because even though I'm not a superstitious person, I just don't like tempting fate right. like that or whatever, you know. Well, Drew, well, you were, you, you've were you been to some of the protests there in L.A. What's your experience been like? Yeah, mm-hmm. I guess before I say that, to respond to some of the things you said and, you know, Trey, the whole thing about speaking it into existence, I mean, I guess I'm leery of that as well, but my honest thought is – this is going to drive turnout mm-hmm. for the election right. generally. And I don't think that's a good thing in terms of winning the election generally. Yeah. Well, and they're going to hold, they're already holding quote unquote Antifa up as this boogeyman and thinking about their ability to do that has existentially, I think led me to my darkest moments a couple of some of the things i saw which i'll get into in a minute um they're going to take the death of a black man at the hands of a white cop and use it as justification to label antifa terrorists and then they are going to eventually arrest many black leaders under that moniker if they don't just eventually add Black Lives Matter to it. And the callousness and political savvy that they have displayed in the last 48 hours to do that. And liberal people and liberal media or even just regular media's inability to see it and playing along with it has been stunning. And I don't say that to defend Antifa because I don't know what Antifa is. I know it yeah. stands for anti-fascist and I'm for that. Right. I know that there's supposedly a group in Portland of about 40 or 50 who started specifically to fight the Proud Boys and alt-rights and Bugaloo Boys who are all racist, alt-right, crazy fucking people who bus and fly into Portland to fight. So if they are doing that, I'm, I think I'm for them. And then I had one experience personally that I've talked about on here before where the Antifa prevented white supremacists from shutting down an Edward Nelson rally when he was running for state senator in Tennessee. Now, that doesn't mean Antifa is perfect. But what I'm trying to get at is I don't know who they are. No one does. So when they get labeled a terrorist group, don't be surprised when prominent leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement get lumped in and get arrested. Don't be surprised when some of your friends and some of your, the people you follow get put on lists, it's fucking happening. Like I'm Mm -hmm. trying not to freak out, but Trump just leaked to the press that he's probably going to do something called, I don't think it's called the, the insurrection act. It's a very old law that gives him a lot of power. If he declares a certain type of emergency, And the people who are going to suffer are leftists and black people. And I'm afraid that it's the perfect political move. They didn't blame the black people. That was super fucking smart. Because for the first time, and at first this gave me some hope, for the first time in a long time, I saw very right-wing people saying, man, that was murder. Right, yeah. And so they didn't blame the black people and it was super fucking smart. And they're saying it's white Antifa and we're going to try to make them terrorists. And I'm telling you, like they're they're, like, it's not going to happen to me because I'm not vocal enough or famous enough, 
But if I were, let's say that our podcast had Joe Rogan type listenership. Yeah. I would be put on the goddamn list. Right. And, and that's for me, one of the things that's so dark and scary, if I were black, I would have on top of that, the realization that people care clearly way more about property and having arguments about property than they do about black lives. I mean, when, when you see people admitting it was murder, but moving immediately on to the looting and their problems with it, it's very indicative of how they feel. But, and I said it on the other podcast when DJ and I talked about it on Into the Abiscuit, you don't need to listen to me for that. You need to listen to black voices and some of the ones that you can listen to, you can look up Cornell West you can look up Killer Mike's speech. DJ and I talked about it. Killer Mike's speech shocked me because it seemed to go against some of the things he stood for in the past. But I got to listen to black leaders. I, you know, I've listened to it twice. I'm going to listen to it again and hear what I'm missing. Um, D. Ray Mackison is one of the Black Lives Matter movement leaders. Um, Michelle Alexander, I think that's her name, who wrote Jim Crow, uh, the new Jim Crow. And then there's a guy that I just learned about, Kendrick. What is Kendrick's last name? I'm going to find it for you guys in a minute, and I'll tell you. He's part of, of the Build Power movement in L.A., and their whole movement is about defunding police. Mm -hmm. These are people you need to listen to about that. If you want to know what happened with me, though, I will tell you. I went to protest on Saturday. I got there on time. I heard Kendrick speak. Um was powerful he was talking about defunding police i didn't know this apparently 54 percent of los angeles county's budget goes to police that's a crazy statistic 54 percent over half of all the money they're spending is going to police in a city where the crime rate has fallen every year for a long time right yeah it's like the defense budget as far as that goes you know it's like and, it, and they look like army people Right, yeah, they're you militarized. I, 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 about the sp specific subject of like defunding them and things like that. I feel I also feel like that's like what has to happen. I wish there was some way to like just effectively, and maybe you do it in waves, so we're not just literally without law enforcement or whatever for an amount of time. But that they could all just be like all of them sort of like laid off and then there's some kind of procedure to get back on the force with an independent agency which should be created yeah. regardless an independent agency should be regardless the sole purpose is to do nothing but you know regulate the police but here's what i've been wondering and i and i'm not trying to be a devil's advocate i'm seriously i wonder about this they have this very very powerful union right the fraternal order of police they have one of the most powerful unions in the whole country and I'm wondering like how the sort of like political murkiness of attacking any union at all, given the larger, you know, scope of like the necessity of unions in general and how much good I believe unions have done as a concept. But obviously this particular one is a huge part of the fucking problem. So like, I have never. How does that work? Well, know? I've never seen any protests, organization, coalition. Police union ain't never marched with any fucking body. Right. But them goddamn selves. Yeah. And almost every leftist I've ever known has acknowledged, even inside other unions, that unions can be co opted. The power can be usurped. You know, they can be perverted. Um, most most people who are really really into that shit argue that uh in the private sector what they really want is the employees to own over half the company and then you don't even need a union per se the company is its own goddamn union so intellectually there's ways around that what i will say on top of that his name is kendrick sampson listen to him mm -hmm. and i'm not saying that to you Joe. i'm saying like if if you're out there right now and you're wondering about this stuff he, he there's literature out there it's all there. You know, black voices are laying this out for us. All we have to do is follow them. And I really think a big problem in this country has been on every side because of internalized racism, all of our inability or unwillingness to do so. Right. Um, and then specifically, Trey, I would respond to you and say, you know, 
yeah, you'd have to have some layoffs, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, there's other ways to do it too, though. Give them a smaller budget so that they can't buy tanks. You know, yeah. just reduce their budget and tell them, we don't want you to, you don't have to uh, pay anybody less. You know, just right. stop spending so much money on the drug war. I, I think um, I might, I think I might have a personal experience that might illuminate so, sort of how that part of it all works for people. And I'm sure a lot of people already know, but like I used to work in federal contracting and show you how like budgets work. Like, and this is like a systemic thing in my experience. What would happen every single time is I worked in contracts, so I had to deal with all the different like parts, like subdivisions in the Department of Energy, like, you know, the facilities people, the environmental cleanup people, all of them, whoever, they all had contracts and they all had budgets. And every single time when budget was coming up, when they're ending the end of a fiscal year, the budget cycle, every single one of them would do this thing, no matter which department it was or how innocuous it might seem or whatever, would do this thing where if they had not legitimately utilized their full budget that year, they would do whatever they could to find places to put that money. Like I remember one time in particular, the facilities people repainted our parking lot and gave out a little contract for that because they had X amount of dollars left in the budget for that year. The parking lot had been repainted the year before and was completely pristine. And I remember asking them like, why? What, Cause why they don't want a surplus. They yeah they and the 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 thought process is we well, want that money not, in the budget next year if we yes if we're not using if we're not using the amount of money we have in our budget they'll give us less next year so we have to use this much so we'll have more because we hey we need a budget and so that what that you know what that what happens with that and like with the police like you're saying Drew is like you know they get a couple more tanks or whatever else like other stuff that they don't fucking need but they're never gonna stop spending money on those things right. as long as they keep having the budgets that allow them to do so because that's why they're doing it in the first place since this big psych cyclical bullshit and uh but yeah that's just sort of how the government at all levels kind of operates in my experience and it's a big part of the problem yeah I, I i have no doubts and i have no doubts that they spend that money on gear that they don't really need that is designed to intimidate and i know that they spend it on training that is clearly not good enough or not taking um just just real quick if you do listen to those black voices and other things they all call for is some sort of community uh, board mm -hmm. that yeah. has real power right to oversee this particular uh officer i won't say his name who uh choked george floyd to death I think he had, it was either 13 or 18 yeah. interaction. He, he killed an unarmed man before, uh, and he had either 13 or 18 investigated examples of abuse. Mm -hmm. If you have a community board, if you spend that budget on a community board that has real power and real teeth and aren't cops, aren't internal investigations. Right. But we all know what would happen to that community board, by the way. They would be threatened. And this is what I was saying about a dark moment for myself is like, we may have already lost the farm boys. And I am for a specific reason that I will get into when I tell what happened or what I saw, I am holding on to hope. And that reason is young people. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get emotional. Uh, the first day I went, I heard, Kendrick Sampson speak they sang and they prayed and I marched and I saw so many different young people full of energy and full of hope and they were white and they were black and they were brown and they were Asian and they were there for George Floyd and themselves and their own future on that day while we were marching something happened where the people in front of me were like go back turn around uh, I was with our friend Carmen I got up on something where I could see and where the people were turning around was close to us, but some people were still going. There was a split and there were police there. I didn't see the cops split us, but that is what happened. At that point, it had been about three hours. And I said, Carmen, you know, cops are here. What are you thinking? And we decided to leave. 
We were walking back to our car and we heard a noise. And we saw people running. Carmen had been, uh, we'd been carrying back and forth. It was her idea to bring it like a traffic cone. Uh, she had seen where if somebody shoots tear gas, you put it over it and then you pour water down there and you can put the canister out. That's cool. So she went that way. I took the cone from her because I could run faster with the cone. We cut down an alley because we saw this police officer like chasing these people in a, in a uh, SUV cruiser. We went down the alley to get around to the other side where they were. We saw them there. They were stopped. Police were out. No one was hitting them and they weren't hitting anyone, but it was real gnarly. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. There was a, there was another cruiser there parked in a weird way. I didn't see how this started. Long story short, those cops took off. Someone knocked out the back window. Then they started beating the fuck out of that cop car. Cops then come back. They got their guns that shoot rubber bullets. They're marching towards us. Uh, we are told by people with megaphones, take a knee. We're told white allies to the front. We're told don't be violent. We're told all the things you're supposed to be told and that they say you're supposed to do according to the white people so who are like, I hate the violence. People with megaphones, you're talking about organizers on the yes. side of the protesters yes. with megaphones saying yes. all this. Okay, all right. To be, you know, in the spirit of being completely honest, I saw one kid with a slingshot towards the back shooting a slingshot with, I guess, rocks over towards where the cops were coming at us. He got dealt with before the cops got close. Someone pointed out that shooting your little fucking slingshot from five rows back of black people and white people who are willing to stand in the front without weapons. Mm -hmm. Like if you're going to fight the cops, go fucking fight the cops. Right. Yeah. And he was either shamed, you know, I didn't see it all, but he was either shamed or physically dealt with. He was gone. Face to face with the cops this last 10 minutes or so. I'll just skip through. I mean, it was us chanting and kneeling and chanting and kneeling and them backing up and eventually they left and this one young black guy probably 19 was like we move the cops off the block and he was celebrating it and he wasn't celebrating it like i hope they all die he was celebrating it like he said i ain't never seen n words move cops off the block mm -hmm. it was like we have power and it was truly sincerely inspiring and then they burnt that cop car <laughs> <laughs> um and that some hits. people have a problem with that. I thought it hit too. Uh, I think that. I know, think normally it don't hit, but in this particular <laughs> instance, it hits. Like I mean, look, what, <laughs> like what, right. look, unless you need a climax to what you're doing, like fucking uh, like burn the shit. And, <laughs> unless somebody's in the cop car, I can't think of any scenario where it wouldn't yeah. hit. I mean, just ca cars on fire, dude. No, I know. And people yeah, were taking right. pictures and like the shitty influencers were up there like posing, and people were calling them posers. And Hell, then, we paid for that goddamn cop car anyways. Burn that motherfucker. Yeah, we burned our car. Fuck y'all. Exactly. Um. My point, though, being is we can walk through at some point all of the types of looting and damaging things, but at the fucking top has to be burning cop cars with nobody in them and police precincts with nobody in them. That has to be the Fuck easiest yeah. one to justify. Whether yeah. you agree with it or not, you have to admit it's the They're easiest the one They're the ones that scenario. did it fucking burn the shit. You didn't hurt nobody. You only hurt prop. Absolutely, man. I mean, I, I think that's what most of it should be. You know, and, but, well, and, and if I'm not, I'm not going to, again, in the spirit of not holding back, watching a black man beat a cop car with a skateboard oh, in Los Angeles. That's awesome. It, you know what I mean? Just something about a black skater. You know what I'm saying? I, know, like I was my, about to say, like, you are, you had me three ways. So we left. And I went home, and I was texting DJ that night. I was like, man, I feel really resolute. These fucking young people, you know? And I went back. And I went to Santa Monica yesterday. And we were later. I didn't hear anyone speak. And as I was walking towards where it was, we had to park like seven blocks away. As I was walking, I walked past a lot of looting, a lot of people breaking into the van store and the Nike store. Lululemon had its well windows boarded up and everybody was making jokes. You know, we ain't stealing from Lululemon, you know. <laughs> I did see where uh, it was a funny picture, at least. That might have been doctored, but it was all these buildings on both sides that had been looted, and in the middle was a croc store that was fine. <laughs> uh, I saw young black people looting. I saw young brown people looting, and I saw young white people looting. 
I saw a few cops in those areas um, walking around. I saw some undercover cops. I saw no one stopping them. The van store was being particularly ransacked at the moment that I walked by it. Like I saw some empty stores that had been ransacked, but I, this van store, the skater store was getting hit pretty hard. A lot of young people. And again, going back to the looting thing, you can judge that, you can not judge it, you can say it's justified, you cannot say it's justified. My whole point is I understand it, A, yeah. and B, it's not really the point. Right. Yeah, and especially, that, go ahead. I was gonna say that's how, I, that's how I've been, I mean, I've been trying not to have kind of conversations right now with people that I know that I know how they feel, you know what I'm saying? Because it's not worth my time. This is not one of those situations where we're gonna find common ground on this, but the only answer that I have is uh, I'm with you. I don't understand how looting helps. I really don't. I don't understand how looting helps. But you know what black people don't understand? Why they keep getting fucking killed just for being black. So you're not supposed to understand it. If I can find any reason in there at all and any point that does make sense, it's that, yeah, this is supposed to confuse you and make you go, what's the reason for this? Because that's how they feel every single day of their life. Again, I don't – it's hard for me to justify – fucking up a business when just go fuck up the cop the the fucking precinct but at the same time it's not i'm not, i'm not the one that feels that way and it's like when it's like when someone commits suicide and someone goes how could they do it and it's like well you don't fucking know the you don't know what was going through their brain when it happened can you imagine if you're at that point in your life i'm not comparing the two by the way i'm not comparing looting to committing suicide. i'm not trying to do that weird thing but i'm saying if, if you get to that point in your life where you think this is the only thing that i can do i'm so out of my fucking mind that this is the only thing i can do then it of course, you, you, you don't understand why, because you you haven't been there. Like, you don't well, fucking know. Right, and that's trauma. That's how people deal with trauma, and, and there's plenty of examples in psychology books and elsewhere that that's how, especially young people, often do deal with trauma, is breaking shit. Yeah, and for sure. Jesus, I still do it. Jesus Christ himself looted in the temple. He overturned tables. He flipped over chairs. He let people's animals go. That was their property. That was a valid legal business at the time. He absolutely did all of that because he had enough. And when I, been, when I have had conversations with people, I've just been saying, we all have the same answer for when it's okay to break stuff. It depends. And that being the case, I'm trying not to judge these people. I will acknowledge that I saw people there that I don't feel like we're doing anything other than being opportunistic. I know that. My point is simply that's a conversation, in my opinion, for a different time. And yeah. besides the point of what we're talking right. about here. Yeah, and that always that's, happens. Right. You know, like that's human nature. Now, you're always going to have that every time, no matter what. Yeah. There's always going to be people who are being opportunistic and, you know, turning any situation to their advantage that they can. And right, like you're saying, I agree with you. It's all like it's beside the point. That's not – none of that is the point. That's like a side effect, but it's not the – thing at hand here it's not what's really going right. on or what's important about any of it to uh, okay me. right so then the part i guess about dark moments and dark days aside from how i know this is all going to be used to hunt down opposition in the name of a black man again what an incredible thing to think about about 100 feet from that vans i saw two lines of cop about 10 deep so 20 police officers on a corner with their backs away from where the looting was happening right behind them. Now, mind you, I've walked by four or five cops. I've seen unmarked, definitely uh, undercover cops watching people loot. I get to these police officers. They have their back to where 100 feet behind them, a van store is being looted. And I round the corner and those cops are looking at a protest in the middle of Ocean Boulevard. And I joined that protest. And that, what is that? Uh, sorry. That was a moment, not necessarily right then, but one that I look back on where it's like, oh. <laughs> They're only talking about the looting because they know the American people give a shit about it. Yeah. They literally didn't care about it. Like, I can't... I, I, I've even tried to play devil's advocate, not because I want to give the police the benefit of the doubt, but because I'm trying to figure out what somebody might say to me, you know, and what I saw, what I personally saw to, like, combat it. 
The only thing I could figure is they had tried to stop the looting and it got messy. And they figured I, let people take stuff instead of stop them to, to, to knock the violence down. If that's the case, let people march. Right. Yeah. Which I'm to, about to get to into. Me, yeah. To me, it's, it's, it's just, they're protecting their best interests. And in my opinion, it is in their best interest for people to be looting and it's right. not in their best interest yeah. for people to be sitting there actually peacefully right. protesting and just speaking their mind. Because when people are sitting there peacefully protesting and speaking their mind, which they still don't want you to do, even though they say this is the right way to do it. It's, you know, the things go viral. Of, of but, So they want to silence those people. But when someone's looting, that's fucking great. They want every goddamn store to be destroyed so that at the end of the week, they can look at the number. They can look mm-hmm. at the, they cost them, $5 million. Uh, hell, our economy just opened up after this pandemic. We can't take any more. And then this is how they, they don't care about you. They're, they're opportunists, blah, blah, blah. They want you to loot, dude. They, that's, and that's, that's the, one of my reasons for like not doing it, even though like I'm, I'm not ever going to tell anyone how to grieve, anyone how to protest, anyone how to mourn. But like, I do believe that it hits for them really hard that, that people are looting like really hard. And you said it, you said it's not in their best interest. And I guess what is hitting me, and this is again, something I think I knew intellectually, but now I know like almost on an emotional level, if that makes sense. It's crazy to think that our police in this country's best interest is for people to loot. Of course it is. And, and, what I, and that's what I said about, we might have already lost the farm boys. Like if Trump told police to stand, like he didn't and he won't, but if he told them to stand down and just, just, just let the fire burn until it burns. They wouldn't. I don't think. I don't think they'd fucking do it. Like, I think that they are anyone who's them, not completely. Sure, yeah. No, it's not some of them. That's what I'm saying. Because it's a paramilitary structure. Quit right. then. If, if your job, if you worked at a place where someone murdered a man by choking him for nine minutes in broad daylight, and the next day your boss told you to shoot rubber bullets at 25-year-olds, no, I hear you. No, I, no, 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 I, buddy, I hear you. I'm just saying, I, I do believe that there's at least a couple people that if the president said, "Hey, stand down," that they'd be like, "All right, fuck it, I'll," you know. I, <laughs> I, and I, I was only doing, right. I was only doing it for the Fuhrer, anyways. And I hope you're right. All right. So I saw that. I went to the protest. Uh, they were having conversations with police officers, uh, and this is an important story to tell too. And this isn't me going not all cops. But this is me acknowledging a thing that happened and talking about the good outcome from it. One officer took all his mask off. He hugged somebody who had a bullhorn. He talked to them. They had a conversation. He talked to another person with a bullhorn. They had a conversation. I couldn't hear any of that. They were reporting back to us. We were chanting, and then we would die down so that they could tell us what they were talking with the officer about. His name was Officer McGee. We were told that Officer McGee said that he understood where we were coming from, that something had happened with the looting, some type of violence that had required a state of emergency to be declared, declared. And because of that, we just couldn't be in the street. And they want us to move to the beach. After some back and forth, and frankly, some arguments between the th- three people with bullhorns, it was decided that we would move to the beach. One of the guys with bullhorns hugged that officer. They posed for a picture. He was the only person with a bullhorn who wasn't black, wasn't white either, but it made me very uncomfortable that he was, you know, now time to pose. But that's what happened. That officer de-escalated, talked to people, took off his shield, became a human being, and people decided, you know, for better or for worse, decided to move to the <clears> beach. And there were people there mad. There were people there that didn't want to move to the beach, but that's what happened. And so we were going to protest at the beach. But when we did that, after we moved, we could see the rest of the street. It was hard because of trees and all the fucking tanks or Humvees that look like tanks and cops. We could see, I realized, they had split the protest again. We were on one side talking to a line of cops. Then there was a line of cops facing the other direction talking to other protesters. As we moved to the beach, we heard an explosion and looked over there, that direction. Well, we said, let's go over there because that's a place where uh, it looks like they're not moving to the beach and there's no way for them to get to the beach because of where they're at because this happened to be right where the I-10 comes in. They split them where I-10 is coming into Santa Monica. So those people had no way to escape. There was a ramp there and then there were cops, the only way they could walk to the beach. So we said, let's go over there and check it out. We get over there. There's a further distance between the police and the people. And 
without trying to like over dramatize it or make too much of a long story of it. There's some conversation about what's going to happen. They tell everyone says, if you're just getting here, they told us at four o'clock they're shooting at us. That's what they told these Wolf. unarmed, mostly white people in the front, black people and brown people behind them, that if you're not out of here by four, we're shooting at you. Four o'clock comes, they don't shoot. 402 comes, they say they're about to. A very angry black man, probably about 35, uh, justifiably angry. I'm not trying to do the stereotype thing. He starts talking about how he's got dead friends and they're always doing this. And if we're not here to really fight then what are we doing here and he throws a water bottle now he's standing all the way off to the side he's not standing in the middle he's not even really in the road he's kind of on the sidewalk he throws a water bottle that lands as a man i will tell you on my life maybe 30 35 feet from these cops maybe and they shoot rubber bullets there's a flashbang which i wasn't familiar with it sounds and looks like a fucking bomb went off mm-hmm we all ran and then we came back and then that just happened over and over again. Two things that I'll highlight. One of the times they shot, no one threw a water bottle or anything their direction. One of the times they shot, a man came, he had on a shirt that said wage love. And he told us that he was acting as a liaison. He told this crowd what had been told to me when I was in the other crowd. There's in a state of emergency. Something gnarly happened, a stabbing or a shooting or something. We can't be here, but they said we could go to City Hall. We're gonna go peacefully to City Hall. There's some arguing. The, uh, the black man who first threw the water bottle was like, I'm not fucking doing that. But a lot of other people were like, look, we ain't got no weapons, we can't fight them. Let's go protest at City Hall. We were about to do that. He's been back and forth now twice. We agree in general that we're gonna do that with a few people saying they won't. He turns to go tell them that if I'm lying, I'm dying, they shoot at him. And this motherfucker kicked a rubber bullet or a beanbag with his foot, just boom, just kicked it down. And I did like that to like, what the fuck? And I will say that whoever he had been talking to told the guy who shot at him, stop. But he'd been back and forth. At the, like, I, I feel like that was to make us react. Sure. Oh, yeah. Um, and he got hit. It's called inciting a goddamn riot. <laughs> Andy got hit during one of these back and forths with a rubber bullet in her leg. Uh, after that deal with that guy, oh, and I will say, I do think that there were people there who were trying to get everyone else. And that, and other than that first guy threw a water bottle, they weren't black, but there were people there who were like, we should throw rocks and stuff. Um, people weren't doing it still, but there were people saying that. There was a construction site right there. People started grabbing plywood and plastic and hiding behind them. I hid behind one at one point and it got hit with something. After they did that with that uh, black guy who was trying to get us to go to city hall and shot at him, they shot tear gas. And uh, that is what ended it uh, in that area. Uh, Carmen had gotten separated from us. I went looking for her in the front part of the park, Andy and Sean. I guess I shouldn't say everybody's name if they don't want me to. Uh, our buddy, Trey, mm -hmm, knows you. Yeah. Funny yeah. accent. Yeah. Him and his girl and Andy went towards the back of the park. I went looking for Carmen. I got what I can only describe as, you know, overwhelmed with the tear gas situation. She answered her phone or called me. I don't remember. Luckily, we got through to each other. She said she was helping people in the park by pouring water on their faces. I eventually found her by the time I got back to Andy. She had had somebody pour milk all over her face. She was choking. We decided not to go to City Hall uh, to go home. When we got to our car, we got an alert on our phone that there was an 8 o'clock curfew. 20 minutes later, at 5.20, we got an alert that said there's a 6 p.m. curfew. It took us 45 minutes to get to our car. Now, I'm not saying that for the, if we had been, you know, gotten there at, at 6.05, we would have been necessarily arrested for being five minutes late. But my point is that shit was a trap. There's no way everyone could get out of there in 40 minutes. Right. Yeah, apparently they were like, goddamn, you can't do shit in 40 minutes. They apparently arrested 
four thousand people or so. They didn't process all of them. I was about to say, fucking how? They Jesus. sent literally every cop there to the protest after the looting had already happened and was basically over. They sent them there after telling them to go to the beach and the city hall, and we did, to arrest everybody. And they did. And all those things, seeing the cops with their backs to the looting, getting that alert 40 minutes before you know, it took effect, knowing that no one could actually abide by that, even if they wanted to. Seeing that cop shoot the guy who was acting as a liaison and a community leader. Again, I knew all this intellectually, I think, but it fucked me up a little bit. Because if they're that willing to do it openly and the media will continue to blame the agitation on outside influencers, because what you've seen here is an evolution. You're not allowed to blame black people anymore because people in America, the zeitgeist, the consciousness is that's not fair. But we're still not ready to blame police for agitating stuff with their fucking riot gear and their weapons and their tear gas and their tanks. So they blame these outside agitators. And I'm not saying these outside agitators don't exist, but they're so easy to take care of. The protesters will offer them fucking up. I, like they will sacrifice. Yeah, I've, stayed, these I've seen it a lot. Exactly. Like that's I saw what in, they in want. DC, I saw like three or four videos in DC of uh, somebody smashing like the street with a, with a hammer or something like that. And these black protesters went, took their fucking mask off and it was a gray haired dude. And they're like, get the fuck out of here. Like you're not helping. Yeah. Um, uh, have y'all, y'all heard of, and I'm, I, I'm not saying that this is what is happening there. I think it's probably a bunch of different types of people that are doing that sort of thing. But, uh, uh, agent provocateurs, you guys know what I'm talking about? I mean, yeah, is man. that, yeah, it's man. like it's cops. It, it's like yeah. cops, yeah, or yeah, undercover cop, and, yeah. Who go and do that exact shit, like for that exact reason? That there was that one. You very can see viral the vest, video, and you can see that. Yeah, yeah. The very viral video of that dude in, in Minneapolis who wasn't even really engaging in the protest and was like, could not have looked more suspiciously like a fucking copy. Cop. Right. He looked like an well, extra in a goddamn. Well, he, he looked like the, an extra in uh, in the fucking. A second Avengers movie. Yeah, well, they, he's back they there breaking these him. windows and shit. Well, they they identified him, and his ex wife ratted on him, and was like, "Those are my fucking boots." Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what uh, a quarter he's wearing his wife's boots. <laughs> uh, and by the way, by ex wife, I mean she filed for divorce apparently like a week ago. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, the Man. media. I don't, dude. I don't. I don't understand. I mean, I do. I could come up with a lot of reasons, I guess, but they're all, you know, unfortunate, disappointing. But I don't get the media with all this shit right now, because specifically because of all the different incidents of cops directly assaulting the press in the in the middle of this stuff, even when they right. are identifying themselves as. <laughs> first of all, most of the time they don't even need to identify themselves as press. They got a full fucking camera and a, crew yeah, a and lanyard, all, the, all, their the, shirts all, the, in. all the credentials and shit right there and the cops are still fucking shooting now they blinded a reporter in nashville yeah with a, a fucking rubber well, bullet or pepper I mean, ball or one of those things right to the face and yet the media there's still this whole narrative of the agitators and the rioting yeah, man. the looting and all this stuff and because, i just don't, i don't understand well to be yeah, fair be, some local news people are talking about those things but I think what's happening, and this is just my opinion, Trey, is a genuine inability and somewhat unwillingness and, frankly, fear for the wolf blitzers of the world to think that police are just shooting reporters for no reason. It's much easier and safer to believe these evil boogeymen, half of which are white supremacists and half of which are these far-left communists, are coming in here and the rest of us are just good-hearted Americans, police and black people who I have, you know, in the last decade only decided I love, you know, and, and I, I can't help but start to be a dick there because I feel angry about it. But, but, but let me try to do it in an empathetic, slightly more human way. 
it, it goes against everything they believe right, about how yeah. the world works. And it is sincerely scary. And part of the reason I'm trying to give them some empathy is even though I knew it intellectually, watching it fucked me up. Yeah. yeah, that one video, of, you know, the curfews are all the curfew. We got a five o'clock curfew today, um, but all the curfews are they exist really just to make it so that the police can take any action they want against any person who's out after the curfew, regardless of what that person is doing. <sighs> and that video of that one that one video, Minneapolis, one of the first sites of their curfew, those fucking cops just walking through a regular neighborhood and there wasn't even people in the streets of the neighborhood. They were literally on their porches, which the governor of Minnesota had already explicitly clarified was completely okay and legal. And the cops were shooting at them. And real quick, the, real quick, the, and this is important. That was the National Guard, not the cops. Go ahead. I thought it was both. I knew they had that National Guard thing in the front, but those dudes all in black and stuff, I, it wasn't a mixture of both. It looked Even like, if it is, I think it's important for us to point out that the feds got involved. The natu in National Guard was part of it. Right, yeah, yeah, the National Guard was in the front of the line. They looked different to me. I definitely thought it was both. And the ones who were like shooting were the ones who I thought looked like cops, but maybe they were all guardsmen. I don't know. But the way, not just the fact they were doing it. I mean, it is just the fact that they were doing it, but also the way they were acting about it. Like, it's like, like they were in a call of duty game or something. They literally, they literally, one of them called out, light them up. And then they just started shooting Jesus. civilians on their porch. And it's oh, like, Roscoe that's Jenkins. Leroy Jenkins. Leroy, my bad. Roscoe Jenkins was the Martin <laughs> Lawrence movie. That was uh, actually hit for me. But um, it's just like the mentality that so many of them have is why I'm so worried about any kind of yeah. resolution or de-escalation of this thing because like they, that's how they work. They're all in like a, a fucking video game. And they're, and minors, they're, you know? and they're a gang. They, they have a right. gang mentality. They get yeah. matching tattoos. When I worked in Miami, there was a group of them that got in trouble because they all got matching tattoos on the drug unit, and it was a skull with guns, and you weren't allowed on the drug unit to get uh, smoke coming out of your gun barrel unless you killed somebody. Wow. What the I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna say I'm going to say two things before we get out of here because it's only two things I have left to say on the situation, the first of which is probably the most Alex Jonesy I've ever seen. Uh, but – Goddamn, two months ago, I don't know if I said it on this podcast, but I definitely said it on Twitter. I told everybody, I was like, look, we've been on lockdown for a long time, and these fucking police stations ain't made their goddamn quota. So as soon as we're allowed to leave again, y'all watch the fucking highways because they're going to be fucking pulling people over left and right to make up for these goddamn months of speeding tickets. And look at these motherfuckers now with these goddamn curfews. It's why I'm not saying I'm not saying that's the only reason why, but I'm telling you there's part of it too. They're making up for fucking lost time. Secondly, secondly, at this point, four years into the or three years into the podcast, I'm certain that this is an echo chamber. Like you, if you're somebody that doesn't at least 84 percent agree yeah. with pretty much everything we've said up until right. this point, you're probably long gone. But for anybody out there who is just having to listen uh, in the car because your spouse, your wife, uh, <laughs> yeah. listen, or or your gay you're gay and you're you know one of them two <laughs> one of them two if you're out there listening and you're not part of that echo chamber i have one thing to say about this situation if you look if you look at the, if you look at this thing if you step back and look at this thing and you are fine with uh, i saw dale murphy braves great tweet the other night that his son had got shot in the face of the rubber bullet blah 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 you know this is bullshit what's going on blah blah, blah. and somebody posted several people actually you won't believe it Braves, oh, former Braves fans, it seems, <laughs> posted on Dale Murphy's page like, well, if your son didn't want to get shot in the face, maybe he shouldn't have been protesting. <laughs> like, so anyways, if you're the type of person out there that has that type of, of belief or you're sitting there fine with saying, well, hey, the media screws around anyways, the media should get shot. If you're one of those people that has that belief, then just admit right now that you don't care about the Constitution. I, that, yep. Like you say that you do. Just admit right, right. now that you don't care. All you want to do is have a fucking gun. Just admit right now that you don't care if you believe those two things. And that's that you give a fuck and that you've never given a fuck. That's all I got to say on this subject. Yeah, I thought that's where you were going. And if you didn't, I was going to, uh, yeah, emphasize that too. Right. These are straight up like the highest 
constitutional rights that any of us have. The first just, one. It's the right, first yeah, fucking one. Right. Are being just, you know, totally disregarded. Like they thought and of this one before they thought of the guns. Right. They only and, thought of the guns because they were like, if somebody tells us we have to shut the fuck up, we won't need to shoot them. So then they thought of the guns. Right. Like cops, like the gut, the fucking, the, even the, uh, the only part of the constitution they do give a fuck about is ostensibly supposed to really be so you can defend yourself against shit like this. This, Yeah. And, they, and uh, yeah, no, they just, right. I'm totally with you that I don't want to hear them harping on about the constitution ever fucking again, but it's just like them with like being pro-life when they're not at all you know obviously they're pro-life while you're in the womb but as soon as you come out they don't give a fuck about anybody's life so i mean they ain't gonna stop but they absolutely should because they've made it very clear that they don't really give a fuck about the constitution or anybody's rights or it's any it's of that. uh that's a big part of why it's scary is we're 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 borderline brainwashed to believe and i think with good intention as we come up that you debate your way through all your problems in this country. That's a big part of what protesting and voting is all about. And the reason that I'm struggling right now is I don't know if we can do that. And from what I saw yesterday, I know we can't fight them. Right. If, if all of us had had a gun, it didn't, it wouldn't have mattered. Right. Trust me. They had well, helicopters yeah, no, and tanks. And, that's, and like, that's what, and that's like, what again, I knew that intellectually, but like I saw it. Right. It was, it's wild to see the massive amount of cops in all their gear. Uh, and then and then on the way out of Santa Monica, 120 more cops came because when they hit the curfew, they sent every unit in the county. Uh, but, but, but they're worried about crime, guys. They're sending every no, unit in the county sure. to a protest sure. that are worried yeah. about crime. Anyway. Yeah, no, I know. And, I and don't, ignoring the looters because they want them to fucking do it. It's bullshit, man. Like, and yeah, I, I don't like, know how to beat them. And – and right. that is what makes me scared and angry and upset the most. But going back to the kids, for them, I'll keep fighting. For them, I'll keep trying to have hope. And they do give me hope. They are smart. I did see a lot of amazing kids. Um, and I think they're better than us. I mean, I think every generation is, frankly, better than the last. And hopefully there is a country for them to inherit. But I'm not, I'm not going to pretend like I'm positive fellas and i and i mean that like in the most dire i'm not trying to be alex jones way i think that fascism is not coming is is here yeah no i no i hear you man like i started and this is fucking this is so this is such a thing for a white dude to say but like i was thinking the other night because i've never like you hear celebrities and i'm not put call myself a celebrity or even saying I was thinking about doing this really like you, but you hear him say, like, Oh, if, if Trump gets elected, I'm fucking, I'm moving to Canada. And they never do, of course, because that's insane. And I've always thought, Yeah, no matter how bad it gets, I would never want to leave. And I've also thought, Well, I just don't have the fucking, I couldn't just leave because my career, like, I'm an American comedian. If I was to move to New Zealand, I wouldn't fucking make it. But I was thinking the other night when all this shit started happening, I was like, Dude, if I just literally, had, if I had retirement type money, I, I think I'd fucking leave right now. And I, that's irresponsible because I'm a person, like I'm a white dude that can vote. I should stay here and be a good person. But it's, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with you, man. Like I, this is like Trey said at the beginning of the podcast and you just said now, I've, I genuinely feel helpless, hopeless, and kind of fucking scared. And yeah. I know that this is all like, who knows if we would feel this way if it wasn't coming off the back of already a shit year like if we hadn't just had the pandemic and this had happened would we feel so helpless and hopeless because it's not like this hasn't happened before um but either way i mean that i'm not, not trying to take I'm not, no that that's right. we got pandemic depression well, uh, no, 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 uprisings I mean, I, tumultuous I mean, situation I mean, and we no. got a fucking nightmare in the white house all no, the no, same I, I, yeah no i specifically perfect storm of I, no, I specifically Shit. meant like, it's not like George Floyd has never happened before. And I'm not right. trying to take away from his death at all. It should not be diminished. But what I'm saying is like, we've dealt with this specific thing, but like, yeah, you add the pandemic, add all that. So, but I, but it doesn't, it doesn't, you can't, you can't say what if this didn't happen? Cause it fucking did. There's no sense in, there's no sense in playing the what if game when we are in the middle of a pandemic, the fucking economy's down. Uh, we have a fucking nightmare child in the white house and now this has happened so yeah i don't know i don't feel good and and uh, i'm you know i don't know man I, and I, I 
also like, what the fuck can I do? Like, I, well, I, I mean, I'll, 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 you know, I'll say it. This is what you do. Uh, you listen to black voices, as I 100. said, you help and you witness, you help and you bear witness, whether it's money or marching or calling a Senator, you do something, you help and you bear witness. Well, it's, it's going to be money. If those are the options, I'm going to well, at least you're being honest. <laughs> uh, I thought it was multiple choice. I mean, true, there. True, I don't true. know. Yeah. You helped without knowing it. I won't flash the whole thing. That's your number on my arm. What? If I got arrested. Oh. <laughs> you were my phone call. And and by the way, everyone else in the car too. <laughs> I, maybe well, not that's... Carmen, but like every, yeah. like like our buddy that I mentioned, he was like yeah. in his accent. I got no one to call. Yeah, I'm sorry. Put this one down. Um, well, yeah, you know, I hope. Um, you're talking about I don't, I, and I don't know what the answer is either. Especially like in this moment, like I don't know how it like deescalates because to me the only way it would it could really deescalate is if you is if cops everywhere did some of the shit that like the I saw the cops in like Flint did or El Paso did were the ones where they like put all their shit down and take a knee or march with the people or whatever it, that but that's not going to happen. And without that happening, I don't know how it ends in the moment. Dude, that's part of what freaks me out so much, but I, there are like, there are, and we were talking about some of them earlier and the and black leaders are already laying these out. Like there are regulatory and legislative measures that could absolutely be taken that would go a long way towards addressing this police state bullshit, but it's just a matter of actually, getting those things done and you'd like to see it on like a community level or state level at least because obviously the federal government's a fucking lost cause but like they're all the the cops you know big cop is just so ingrained in the highest levels of american society and shit that i, I you know i'm not gonna sit here and act like i'm hopeful about that but i'm there are answers to it we just have to employ them because it's just like when the fucking when the you know the capitalists were literally just chopping people up and putting them in the canned meat they made in their factories and whatnot and all that stuff you know what i mean like yeah there were answers to that too and then but and there were ab violent, abandoned a lot of right. them but, but, well, but there were violent answers. but there were violent protests right and bloodshed and the capitalists didn't have guns right yeah yeah. Do. yeah yeah um but anyway, that's that's what I think we got to do in general. I'm trying to be hopeful. I wanted to say one thing. Oh, it was – I saw the pictures of those people kneeling and all that stuff too, and, and I'm glad that those cops said that and did that. I will say in nearly every picture I saw, if you go to the replies, someone was like – almost every time someone's like, I was there. An hour later, they shot us with tear gas. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah The kneeling out. was to get them to leave. Right. It wasn't yeah. to say really that I'm with you. It was to say, I agree if you'll leave. Well, somebody picture, posted that picture of, of Jerry Jones, too. They were like, I'm tired of this fucking acting, because it was like one day Jerry Jones was kneeling with the players, and then the literal very next day was like, any of my players caught protesting the flag will not play. You know? Like, yeah. they want it for that quick little fucking picture and soundbite or whatever, and yeah. then it's over. So it's horse shit. Nothing, and like I saw, I saw a police chief in Houston give a speech to the protesters. He was out there without a mask on right among them. And I, and I think he meant what he said as a human being. I also know as a police chief, though, that he arrested everybody after a certain time and then blamed all the violence on anyone but his own cops. And I, I, that's just not honest. Yeah, man, no. no doubt. And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I don't, I ain't, I ain't got much left in the tank to say mm -hmm. about it. Not, not cause I want to jump off here, but just because, I mean, at this point, hell, we've done this episode before, not this, you know, specifically on everything that's happening here, but it's not like we haven't had to talk about this. And at this point, it's just like, fuck man, I don't know what we're going to do, but I, God damn it. Vote fucking vote. That's the only thing that I know to do that I, it's within my power that I can that I can do and that some of you can do fucking vote. And, you know, like, like Drew was saying, just, you know, support, be supportive and be yeah, on the right sure, side for of sure, it for sure. whatever way you can. For sure. And Money, I guess, talking to people, engaging. And I guess have, have the guts to engage with your white 
family members. Yeah, or... that's why I've seen a whole lot of black people saying that, you know, if white people talk to other white people and let them know that, you know, how you feel about this and everything. Now, you know, obviously, I problem is they'll like... let you know how you feel, how they feel. I mean, right, I've yeah. seen so much. Yeah. Well, I've just seen all this anti-white and anti-cop stuff, like all whites are evil. And I'm like, no, you haven't. No, if you saw a picture of a meme of somebody saying Black Lives Matter said they were going to kill all white people, uh, a fucking white supremacist group made that meme. You have not seen that. Right. Yeah. And I, I, with, with me in particular, I'm lucky that most of the white people in my family are close to me. I already feel the same way. But also even those that don't like and I mean, you know, they all they know. <laughs> well, yeah. they know how I feel. About I, it. I was about you know to say, like, like I feel that. I feel. I feel lucky in the sense that like, yeah, I'm the only reason I'm not having to have these conversations is because yeah, again, they're just not going to bring it up. (laughs) Like, Yeah. But I think we have to bring it up. No, I know. But dude, like there's some that I hear you, but like, it's like, uh, you know, you know what they say? They say, uh, they say don't wrestle with the pig because you, you know, you just get muddy and the pig liked it. That's how it is with a lot of these motherfuckers. Like they are fucking blue, blue stripe flag having. It don't matter. It doesn't because they're they're the same ones. Like you said that like they're gonna see that meme and they're like they're gonna show that to me and go look here and I'm like a fucking white supremacist made that and they're gonna go oh that's what the liberal media wants you to think they fuck da da da. So like no I'm, I mean I, some of them I can't have that conversation with because that time is more valuable spent doing something else because they don't give a fuck. They're going to double down. They're just racist, and they fucking hate – they're glad that George Floyd is dead. Some of them are glad that he's dead. They don't give a fuck. And these aren't my friends, by the way. I'm talking about just people I see out that, you know – Yeah, but that's different, you know. I don't think you need to accost people at a grocery store, but, um, you know, I think you got to talk to people. And because because I saw so many people saying – Things like this looting is not about justice for Mr. Floyd, but I do hate that they killed him. It's like, oh, the talking's working. I can it talk is, to it, I can talk to that person though. But my point is that person a year ago was saying, Where's the rest of the video? Right. My point yeah, being sure. the talking is slowly working and it's yeah. too little and it's too late, but we have to keep doing it just in case there is a future. We have to. Not for nothing. I also think, and I, I'm, I too think, you know, we can, we definitely can wrap it up. But I also, yes, the talking is working. I think another thing that is working is that, like, the repeated assault upon these people's senses of video evidence of cops right. being right. fucking murderers, meaning like the necessity for body cams and all that shit, and like smart dude, smartphones and everything, because like they've always been this way. They've always been doing it. But now right, they can see it now. Now everybody can see it. And like, I don't care how entrenched you are. Well, some people are too entrenched to come out of it. But for your average person who otherwise would have been very much on the side of the police, like you see enough videos of a fucking cop shooting somebody or choking somebody to death or whatever over and over again. And eventually you start to think like, man, fuck, maybe there maybe is something wrong yeah, here. You know? right. So like I'm saying, and my point with that is, it's at a head right now. I'm really worried about how it's going to go, but I don't, we had a conversation after um, one of these horrific incidents early on in the podcast where I was saying, I don't think that it ultimately behooves the cops to continue to just be the way that they are. Of course not. And publicly. And I'm so I'm saying like, you know, I think that, that also is a big part of well, hopefully changing people's minds. Yeah, that's it's like they've laid their true colors this, so bare. So this hopefully dude needs enough to get, people will realize this, this dude needs to be convicted dude, of yeah. fucking murder. Right. The, the lady in Texas was convicted of murder. A couple more of those happen. And then, I mean, I'm not saying there's still not going to be some trigger happy people who genuinely were like, I was afraid of my, for my life, but like surely to God, they're going to realize, Hey man, you, we can actually go to jail this time. We can't be fucking doing this. You can't you can't choke somebody out on fucking camera, bro. I don't know. I think uh, I need to mention, just in relation to that, it just came out. I just saw it. Uh, first of all, Louisville killed a man last night. The Louisville police shot a man yeah. during the riot last night. Yeah. They claimed they heard a gunshot, and then they just opened up on a whole group of people. It was probably one of theirs. Uh, well, it just was announced by the mayor that – none of them literally no cops had on their body cameras 
of oh, really? yeah. Oh, which means guy. they were instructed, all of them, to not have them on. That that should is be illegal. Period. Fascism. Like yeah, that's yeah. well, who's gonna who arrests the cops? Right. Who no, watches know, the I Watchmen? Know. No, right. Well, that's the thing. That's You're what. Right. That's what. Uh, yes. Hopefully, if they some more start getting convicted, they will start at least thinking to themselves. Maybe I shouldn't murder this time. And, but also, like we just need. We can't. They have to start holding themselves accountable. Accountable. But we cannot just wait for them to actually start policing themselves. Like we have to put some fucking measures in place that only apply to cops and are only about policing instead of just like, yeah, murder applies to all of us. And if you're a cop the law applies to you too. A huge step is making sure they all fucking understand that. But we need shit that is only for them. You know what I mean? Like yeah, regulations sure. and laws and stuff that only apply to cops. And if you want right. to do that job, then you have to abide by yeah, those. And we need an independent fucking agency or collective of eight, these community boards, whatever we can, we need some independent auditors yeah. that can hold these motherfuckers accountable. And that's the only way it, you're, it's ever going to start yeah to it's change. like uh it's like what chris rock said he's like look man there's some jobs that just can't have bad apples right yeah you know he's like look if you got he's like you, you would never see united like be like most you know most of our pilots are good but we got a few bad apples that like to crash into mountains you know yeah. sorry right like no right. sometimes you gotta all be good <laughs> yeah right Right, because with pilot, they have enough fail safes in place to where that type of thing cannot happen because yeah. they realize that it's unacceptable for that shit to happen. There's no reason you can't do that same thing with cops, you know, like it can't happen. And there's ways to keep it from happening no matter what the fuck they say. But All right, anyway, well, well, we guys, solved it, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> like we always do. If you're out there. <laughs> Um, I'm sure I know on Drew's page, probably you've got, you've you've shared some links in the past couple of days of places you can donate. Um, if not, I will throw some up before this episode goes out. There's a cool thing that I saw on our buddy Kenny DeForest uh, page. I think he shared that like, it's a thing where you can, you can go and they like split the tab for like bail or some shit like that. So like you can donate a lump sum and it will get divided amongst several people's bails you know what i'm saying so it's like a gofundme for like everybody that somebody's organized obviously research all that shit before you do it you know and make sure it ain't some fucking hacker in abu dhabi trying to get one over on you but um there's ways to donate uh there if there's you know a march in your area go to that uh donate help people out and as drew said and as everyone should be saying just listen to black voices and um uh be safe yep all right well love y'all Love y'all. Oh, <laughs> oh, nothing hits.